you'd have to be almost deaf, dumb, blind, maimed, and living under a rock to not be impacted by the current political climate. When we have so much going on, so much rhetoric, so much political pundency that is before us at all times, what are we to do as Christians? Well, in this episode of the Midweek Refill, I'm going to share with you a Christian response to the current political climate. I'm Bishop A. Reginald Littman, and you're watching the Midweek Refill. The Biden Trump election has left many Christians grappling with how to respond to the heightened political tensions and divisions that have emerged. As followers of Christ, it is crucial to reflect on how our faith guides us in navigating these turbulent times. And so this study is not going to be a political uh, video. I don't have time for that. In fact, I don't even care what people and presidential candidates have to say. In this day and time, I think what we need to know is what does God have to say? And so this study aims to explore a biblical approach to the current political climate, offering insights on how Christians can respond with wisdom, with grace, with mercy, and yes, even with integrity. So let's turn our hearts to the word of God for direction for our lives. And here's the first way that a Christian should respond to a time of political chaos. Number one, seek first God's kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God. You know this verse already, Matthew 6, 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. This is teaching us in Matthew 6, about the necessity and importance of not going after fitness and fashion and future and even finance, but rather putting him first. In the midst of political turmoil, as we're seeing today, our primary focus should be on seeking God's wisdom and his righteousness. Well, what does that mean, you ask? Well, this means prioritizing our spiritual growth and commitment to God's principles above all else. We're always hearing promises and principles and things that candidates are offering in exchange for a vote. But family, all that matters is God's kingdom. And what God's word says has to supersede any promises of any candidate on either side. You see, what God's word says must preempt all of the promises. When we seek God's kingdom first, everything else falls into place, and our political actions should reflect our heavenly citizenship. So choose based on what God's word says and what those promises and principles align with. Here's number two. Love your neighbor as yourself. Mark 12 and 31, Jesus teaches us about the great commandment, loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind. But then he continues in Mark 12, 31, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these, he says. Family, political differences should never undermine the command to love our neighbors. And this love that we must have as believers, even in times of topsy-turvy politics, has to transcend and supersede everything. How we treat people must be that of Christ. One of the major things that we see now is the infighting amongst Democrats uh, to try and remove President Biden and 
Republicans who have their own sets of wars going on. But ultimately, we're neighbors. And we all must learn to show love and respect one for another. You see, our love for others is the best indication of our love for God. In politics, let's love with the right attitude and let's serve and let's be kind to one another. And here's number three, be peacemakers. Be peacemakers. Now, Matthew 5 and 9 says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. If you really want to reflect God, act like God, be considered a child of God, that, my friends, is obtained, according to this passage, by being a peacemaker. They will be called the children of God. Now, Jesus calls us to be peacemakers, actively working to resolve conflicts and promoting harmony in a divided political climate. Christians are called to be agents of peace, fostering dialogue, meaning there's conversation and exchange of ideas going on. Understanding should be amongst us and reconciliation, which also would include forgiveness where it is needed. And this requires humility. It requires patience and it requires commitment to unity. You see, peacemakers are not just passive or pansy. They actively seek to create peace where there is conflict. And that's our role. That, friends, is a Christian response to a time of political chaos. And here's number four. We are charged to pray for leaders and authorities. Now, these are the words attributed to the Apostle Paul, written in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. He says this, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, not just some, but for all people, regardless to political preference. For kings in our day and time, that would translate to presidents and governors and etc., senate, congress, etc., for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. What a powerful passage that is. You see, praying for our leaders is a biblical mandate that transcends political preferences. It doesn't matter what side a person is on, red or blue. It doesn't matter. Praying for leaders is a biblical mandate that transcends all political preferences. And by lifting up our leaders in prayer, we acknowledge God's sovereignty. We seek God's guidance. We seek God's wisdom. And we pray and seek God's authority in every situation. This practice of prayer for our leaders, regardless to who they may be, helps us to maintain a posture of humility and trust in God's ultimate plan. Prayer, friends, is the most potent weapon in our political arsenal. It aligns us with God's will and it aligns us with God's power. So in my conclusion, I want to just end this with a little throwback. Back in the, I think it was the 90s, there were these very popular bracelets everybody was wearing with four initials on them. WWJD. What would Jesus do? Well, family, as you think about what Jesus would do, Jesus would talk to his enemies. Jesus would approach it with humility. Jesus would have unwavering commitment to God's will. Jesus would engage with the political issues of his day with compassion, with truth, and a focus on God's kingdom. Jesus cared for the marginalized. Jesus spoke truth to power. 
Jesus called for justice and for mercy. And as his followers, you and I are called to do the same thing. We should strive to reflect his character in our political engagements, prioritizing God's kingdom, loving our neighbors, promoting peace, praying for all leaders. By doing so, we can be a light in a very divided states of America. We, as Christian believers, if we'll just fulfill our responsibilities, we can point others to the hope and to the unity that is only found in Jesus Christ. You see, following Jesus means following his example of love, justice, and peace in every aspect of our lives, including our political lives. So let's remember that our ultimate allegiance is to Christ and to his kingdom. And let our political actions be a testament to our faith in him. If you're not registered, get registered to vote and exercise your democratic right. Democracy is how our nation runs. Exercise your right to vote. But before you vote, ask God to show you which way you need to go and embrace God's principles as we elect or reelect the next president of the United States of America. Hey, I know this was a little different, but I want to hear what God has to say in times of political chaos. I'm Bishop Littman, and you've been watching the Midweek Refill. Don't forget to check out my brand new podcast. It's called Faith Walk with Bishop Littman. I'm going to leave a link down in the description below. And we love you so much. May God bless you. God keep you. Don't forget to get the PDF handout that goes along with this. Until next time, you go with God.